to be strengthened by his spirit with might unto the inward man. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Words, dear faithful, that come from today's epistle. When we sit and reflect upon it, we know the answer to this question. For what purpose are we created? Of course, as the Catechism tells us, we're created for one purpose, one purpose only, and that is to go to heaven, to save our souls, is the sole reason why we are created. As our Lord says, what doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? It makes no difference what happens to us in this life, how successful we are in this life, whether we gain riches or we become successful in business or we become extremely smart or athletic or famous. None of that matters if we go to hell. None of that makes any bit of difference in the eyes of eternity. But it's our goal to save our souls. That's the only goal that truly matters. And with that goal firmly in our mind, we have to ask ourselves, how do we get there? How can we save our souls? The short answer to this is by the grace of God. We save our souls by the grace of God. But that's a nice thing to say, but it requires a bit more explanation for us to really understand that. We, we, we get the concept, but we don't really know what it means to be saved by God's grace. So, why do we need grace to get to heaven? Because we do. There's no way to save our souls unless God aids us by supernatural grace. And the reason for this is, in order to move towards heaven, which in itself is a supernatural goal, man has to be able to perform supernatural actions to get closer. And to be supernatural... It means to do something above our nature. It means to do something higher than what, on our own plane, we're capable of by ourselves. As man, I can do, you know, a myriad of functions as a, as a, as a, as a human being. But to gain one step closer to God is above my own nature. And so I need help to get there. And that help comes to us from on high, from God himself. Also, the reason why we need grace to get to heaven is that since the fall of Adam, man is inclined towards evil. Once sin entered the world, our inclination is not to do good things, but rather to fall into sin more, to give into temptations, to do things contrary to what God is. So with this tendency, with this tendency towards evil, we have to have something to fight against that. And that fighting against it is grace. Think of it like this example. Think of a kayak. A kayak sitting in a river is always going to flow downstream. It's always going to float in one direction alone by itself. It's only when the man sitting in the kayak provides an extra power by rowing against the current that he can work it upstream against that current. So we tend towards evil, and the only way to go against that stream towards the good is to have someone greater than ourselves, someone greater than the kayak rows it, well, someone greater than ourselves has to aid us in propelling ourselves forward, and that is God, and the propulsion is grace. So what is grace? Grace is defined in the Catechism as a supernatural gift of God bestowed upon us through the merits of Jesus Christ for our salvation. This gift is given to us out of God's goodness. It's not something that we deserve, but it's something that because God is so good, he gives to us generously. It's something that because he desires us all to get to heaven, that he's going to lead us there. He's going to aid us to get there. We've done nothing in our lives that entitles us to graces, but rather God gives them freely, gratuitously to us, and he entrusts them to us. The gift of grace is interior. 
not an exterior gift, as we often think of. When we think of a gift given, you, your, your mind automatically focuses on something external, exterior. Like if I gave a, the gift of, of, a, uh, of a rosary to somebody, they can, they can hold it in their hands. They can see it. It's a physical thing that, that, that is given to them, and it's a gift. But grace is purely interior. It acts not on our bodies, but on, a, on our souls. Grace is supernatural and has to be, therefore, applied to something greater than the natural plane. That is, once again, our souls. It cannot be sensed by our other faculties. And it cannot be you know, taken in through sight or smell or taste or touch or any of the, the, the five senses of man, but rather it's something that affects us on a spiritual realm, not on a physical realm. And as such, being supernatural, as we said before, it is something that cannot be gained purely by a human action. It comes from, all grace comes from Christ, and all grace comes from Christ in his passion. That passion and death that he suffered for us was the price paid in order to gain all the graces for mankind. And the efficacy of that sacrifice on Calvary was infinite. So there's no limit to the, to the amount of graces that we can gain. But it doesn't come to us because I've done something for them. It comes to us because Christ did something for those graces. He merited them by his passion and death. And thus he gives them to us to help us to merit from his passion, to, 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 uh, to receive the fruits of his passion. There are primarily two types of grace. You can break down grace into many different categories, but the two primary types of grace are sanctifying grace and actual grace. Sanctifying grace comes to us at baptism. We do not possess that grace until we receive the washing labor of baptism. We um, <clears throat> Sanctifying grace was given to Adam and Eve at their creation, yet they lost that by their fall. And thus they didn't have it to give back to another their, their children. They didn't have that to pass on. And so now every person is born in the state of, of original sin because that was lost there. But God in his infinite goodness gives us a way to regain that. And that is by the sacrament of baptism. Sanctifying grace is a static grace. That's, a, a, that's the main distinction between sanctifying grace and actual grace is that it's static. What does that mean, static? Static means is that uh, it is non-moving in the sense that it doesn't it doesn't go away until we give it away. We can hold on to sanctifying grace from the time of our baptism all the way through our death and never relinquish it at all, provided that we don't fall into mortal sin. Mortal sin is the only way that we get rid of of sanctifying grace because we have chosen in that action to throw that grace away. And it's only by that free will choice to get rid of grace that we lose sanctifying grace. A good way to remember that is when you think of static, like static electricity. You know, if you if it's there in the wintertime and everything's dry and you shuffle your, your, your soft feet along the carpet, you know, that static electricity builds up inside you. And it stays there. It doesn't go away until you touch something metal and then that's when the little spark jumps out. That static grace stays in our souls until we willfully do something to get rid of it. Mortal sin, that is. Mortal sin, though, takes away sanctifying grace, but God, again, gives us a means to recover that. He gives it back to us when we, whenever we make a good confession, make use of the sacrament of penance, and sanctifying grace returns back to our souls. So, sanctifying grace is there until we get rid of it. Actual grace is a, is a wholly different grace. Actual grace lasts only for a duration of time. 
It's a, it's a fleeting grace, not to mean that it, that it passes necessarily quickly. It lasts either a short time or a long time, depending on our need for it. But it's there for our specific need. And once that need has passed, the grace passes along with it. Actual grace is a, it aids us by shifting our inclinations. Actual grace is that paddle. It shifts us from that tendency towards evil and helps us to move towards the good. Actual grace is something that is given to all men. It's not necessarily just given to those who are baptized, but it's given to all. Although we, there is a breakdown in that, in which we'll get to in a moment, because all men receive enough grace in their lives to save their souls. God would not be all good if he didn't give the opportunity for every person to get to heaven. If he didn't give them sufficient means to save their souls, that would mean that God created somebody purely to go to hell. And that is so contrary to the nature of God. It's something that would make him evil in that regard. And that is impossible because he's all good. So all receive sufficient grace to be able to save their souls. And these graces move them towards the finding of the truths of God, moves them towards understanding him better. If a person is not a Catholic, then actual grace moves them towards the truths of God and towards their conversion. That grace aids them along the way. They think of, of things of God and they, and they have the choice to make to to research that a little bit more, or to find somebody that can help them, or to be able to choose to accept those truths, and then eventually to accept the true faith of the Catholic Church. That it's, you know, when presented to them, they adhere to it because they've cooperated with the graces given to them to be able to do so. Also, the type of actual grace that's given to all men uh, helps those who are already Catholic but if they've fallen into mortal sin. Actual grace draws these types to repentance. It draws them back to to obtaining that sanctifying grace in their soul again. And actual grace also aids all men in avoiding evil. It aids all men to turn away from temptation in order to fight against that and to do to do the opposite, to to succeed in rejecting the temptations that come to all of us. Yet while actual grace certainly comes to all men, there are some actual graces that are given only to those who are in sanctifying grace, because these graces draw one to perform supernatural actions to get closer to God that is impossible for those outside of the state of sanctifying grace. Because being in the state of sanctifying grace means that one loves God. And these actions of grace, for instance, a person in, who performs an action of charity, that supernatural action of charity has for its very aim the love of God. But if we are in a state of mortal sin, then we can't be said to truly love God because we have rejected him at some point, because we have tossed him completely out of our lives. And so therefore, the actual graces cannot be obtained for a true act of charity because we don't have God, the love of God at our main focus. And we can't, uh, you know, but it doesn't mean that we can't do good things and gain actual graces to bring us back to the state of grace. But to gain that treasure that builds up and aids us along the way in loving God more and more, that is something obtainable only to those who are already in the state of sanctifying grace. Actual grace also aids us in our will to do good. It doesn't force us to do good. It doesn't force us to obtain the things of God, but aids us along the way. So this is a very important distinction in understanding grace. Grace is given to all men in order to bring them to God. But it's up to them to actually choose to accept the graces and to cooperate 
with them. And nobody can work against that action of the will. This is something that even God himself does not work against. He's given men free will. It's the greatest gift that he's given us because by that free will, we can choose to love and serve him. By that free will, we can choose to get to heaven. But it's not really actually free will unless we can choose to do the opposite. Unless we can choose to do evil, choose to to commit sin, and choose to cast God away from us. So, grace is there for us, but it's not forced upon us. We have to choose that. Let me give you an example of, of, of a situation of, of either one of those. The first is in the positive. Someone who is presented with actual grace for conversion and chooses to accept it. There's a, uh, a young man that I worked with recently in uh, catechism classes for his conversion. And very, on a natural plane, very nice man, very, uh, nat- you know, um, naturally uh, gifted in, in the sense of towards towards the thing of natural virtue, but not ever been born or raised as a Catholic. He was a Protestant his whole life long. Well, he met this Catholic young girl, and they had found interest in each other, and the whole family, including the girl, were worried about, is he going to convert? Is he ever going to become a Catholic? Is he ever going to, to uh, work in a way of, of, of becoming in, coming into the church? And when I met the man for the first time, these, these worries were presented to me. And, you know, what are you going to do, Father? How are you going to help? And so I simply looked over at him and I said, have you ever thought about becoming a Catholic? And he said, well, yes, actually, I've thought about it many times. And I would like to study, I'd like to learn, and I'd like to work towards baptism. That was it. The grace was presented to him, and he grabbed hold of it, and he worked with it. And then went all the way through catechism and converted to become a Catholic. Yet on the flip side, we know that people do indeed reject grace. One time, on the, on the negative side, I was at a hospital going to, to, uh, to visit one of uh, my own sick. And while I was there, I was met in the lobby by a, a Catholic couple whose, whose mother were in, was in the hospital. And she was born and raised a Catholic her whole life, had fallen away later on. And they asked, well, you know, would you come and talk to with my mother, would you perhaps, you know, say some prayers with her and things like that. She's dying. She only has a matter of a couple of days to live. And when I showed up there, she tossed me out of the room, cursing and swearing, and absolutely was completely agitated at the very fact that a priest would come in that moment, that, that opportunity to convert before her last breath was given to her, yet very painfully, she turned away from it. So accepting, grace is given to all, but accepting it and working with it is something that only you and I can control for ourselves. We have to be the ones to cooperate with grace. But the more we do cooperate with grace, the people who do so regularly are more likely to receive more graces than those who don't. So the more we keep performing actions to, to align ourselves with God's will in our lives, to perform good actions and avoid evil, the more we work with graces, the more and more we'll continue to do so in the future. If we resist temptation five times in a row, then I have a much greater chance of resisting that temptation the sixth time. Why? Because I get more and more graces along the way. And I've perfected myself more and more, little by little. It's much like if you had, you know, a treasure that you were trying to distribute to people who needed it. And you saw that there's these five poor people there. And you gave out parts of the treasure to each of them. And some of them, you saw them put them towards good ends, towards their own food and towards their own shelter and towards, you know, finding themselves occupations and things like that, and some of them went and gambled it away, you'd be more likely to give more of the treasure the next time around to those who used it wisely than to those who squandered it. And God's no different. The the graces are the treasures of heaven. They are the greatest treasures that we can have. And so he gives more to those who have proven themselves to be good stewards 
of the graces that they've received up to that point. So it not only helps us in regards to fighting against the temptation right here and now by the graces that we receive, but by doing so well, it helps us to fight against future temptations because we'll be given even more graces the next time around. Also, cooperating with actual grace will build up a greater storage of sanctifying grace in our souls. Sanctifying grace, while static, the ability to be in sanctifying grace, the strength of that, if you will, can increase. Think of Our Lady, when she was always full of grace. Never once was she ever deficient in the amount of graces that she had. But her whole life long, she continually grew in grace as well. It's like that picture of having a cup filled up to the brim with water. And then, as it's filled up to the brim, you get a bigger cup and then fill that cup up to the brim. Every time we cooperate with grace, we, we strengthen our own state of grace, our own sanctifying grace, and we get a big, little bit bigger of a cup for ourselves. And thus, we become more pleasing in the eyes of God, and we love and serve him more by our actions. So, understanding grace better brings us to that next question. What are our duties regarding grace? Well, the first part of our duties regarding grace is to protect sanctifying grace in our lives at all costs to protect it and guard it as the most precious of treasures that it truly is. Because there is nothing more important than sanctifying grace in our souls. It is the difference between loving God and and not loving God. It is the difference between going to heaven and going to hell at the end of our lives. Sanctifying grace is that one possession that we must never relinquish, no matter what the cost. And... It's also our duty that if perhaps we do, through our own frailty, fall into mortal sin and give up that grace, that we come as quickly as we can and make that good confession to regain that great gift, to bring it back and then begin to guard it anew, to guard it with a new sense of urgency and protecting against all of those who would seek to take it away. We also have a duty to pray for others especially those who are outside the church now or those who have fallen away from the church. We, can't, we know we can't force their will, but we know that we can aid them greatly in bringing them along. And the more we pray for them and the more we sacrifice for them, the more and more likely they are to actually cooperate with that grace because the grace is put there again and again before their faces. And again and again they see that it is a good thing. And each time they have to choose to cooperate with it or not. And eventually, if we continue to pray and we continue to sacrifice, and eventually, hopefully, they will grab hold of that line of grace. Think of it as a a drowning man out in the water. We throw him a lifeline. It's up to him to grab hold of that line to be able to be pulled to safety. And he can choose to not grab onto it. But we pray a second time And we move that line a little closer to him. And we pray a third time, and we move it closer yet still, and we sacrifice, and it gets closer and closer. And the ability to reach out and grab hold of that becomes easier and easier for them. And the temptation to do the good becomes greater and greater for them as the more we put it in their face. And so we never cease in praying and sacrificing for those who need conversion. We also have to remember that it's a duty not only to pray for those around us, but it's also a duty for us to pray for ourselves. Because, as we showed at the beginning, we need grace to save our souls. We need the aid of God in order to advance spiritually. And yet, we remember to pray for those who most blatantly need graces, those who are outside the church, or those who have fallen away or are living bad lives. And we often remember to pray for those who we care about the most, our loved ones, our family, our friends, and things like that. But what gets neglected sometimes 
is to ask for the graces that we ourselves need. We know that we have faults. We know that we have weaknesses. And we know that those things stand before us to be worked on. And the temptation comes to us that, that really does tempt to take us away from God. Yet, it's up to us to pray that we get the graces that we need to fight those very specific temptations. It's not a selfish thing to do. In fact, it's a necessary thing to do. So don't neglect and don't forget to pray for yourselves and to ask for the very graces that you need in fighting your battle for your own soul. Also, make sure that you make use of the normal means of graces that are there. Make sure that you're saying your daily prayers, most especially your rosary. Make sure that you come to confession frequently. Make sure that you make many good holy communions. Make visits to the Blessed Sacrament when you can. Making that little sacrifice, that little extra effort to do something above and beyond the norm will work so much to aid you in your way towards sanctification. When we think about life in general, and and men in general. We see so many instances of people striving after some sort of physical good, some sort of (coughs) physical treasure. We see so many instances of men even dying for these types of treasures, dying for riches, dying for power, dying for fame, or whatever else may tempt them in that way. Yet, how easily do we fail in persevering in our own quest for the greatest of treasures, our quest for grace, and even at times seeing that we throw away grace altogether by committing sin. But it is this fighting of the good fight, and by doing all that we can to gain graces and to cooperate with them in our lives, by guarding our souls against all the assaults that come against it, It's this that we are able to build and obtain the treasure, really the greatest of treasure, for our souls, those of grace. And this treasure that we can build up in this life, this is a treasure that separates itself from all of those other treasures which men fought so hard for in their lives, even giving of their very lives for. It separates itself so much from them because... This treasure alone continues to go with us after we've died. This treasure alone can last for eternity. And it's for that that we find a fight that is truly worth fighting. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.